community has to offer. And tonight's guest is Henry Walker. Welcome, Mr. Walker, to Sipping on Ink. <laughs> good morning, good morning, good morning. It is good morning. And uh, you're in Detroit, right? I am in Detroit, absolutely. Nice. Right, right. It is in the morning there. It is in the evening here, the end of my beautiful day here in Hanoi. And we're going to talk about a lot today, tonight, today, today, this morning. I got to get on this time thing. But um, what we always start out with, Henry, is the easiest question of the night. And that is, who is Henry Walker? Um, well, mo mostly I'm just my parents' child. I'm not really nobody other than that, kid, other than that child. So, um, but, uh, <laughs> but when I'm not their child, uh, I do fancy myself an artist. Um, I do work a nine to five. I work in human services. Um, I have a, a, a true 20 plus year old son who is interesting to say the least. Um, I, um, and I just do a lot. I, I kind of fancy myself sometimes like a, a comedian, and I am so corny, so um, it doesn't come off right all the time. But for the most part, I'm just I'm just regular Joe Schmo. I'm I'm regular folks um, from Chicago, born and raised. So I'm a Chicagoan until I die. You know. Uh oh. Everyone. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and and I'm a West Side Chicagoan because there is a difference. Okay. And, uh, and so yeah, that's pretty much who I am. You know, I'm um I'm just this guy I moved here and um. You know, I've been here for almost 10 years and um, it's, it's 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 a different space. So I'm still kind of maneuvering this space even in this time. So I do fancy myself a bit of a, a an, an urban <laughs> frontiersman at this particular point, because Detroit is uh, definitely um, one of these spaces where navigating it, you you're crossing a bunch of lines every day. And so but I'm enjoying it. So I'm just the, I'm just enjoying life. So that's really who I am. <laughs> now, we met in Detroit. Um, by by happenstance, just walking and cross paths at an um at an event there, uh, and I can't think of the name of it. it. Crossed my mind, and it went the other way. Um, fire and ink. Fire and ink at the right was, time. It, was it fire and ink, or was it? Because I thought I met you years ago at that um. It was a youth conference. Oh my gosh! Yeah, we did there too. Yeah. Oh, wow! I got to get that. Yeah. yeah. Oh. I was walking across this. We were at this conference and I was presenting uh, a class, really. And Henry was walking. We passed each other. And he said, hey, are you sipping on ink? And I was like, holy crap. Yeah. He was like, yeah, I follow you on Facebook. And I was like, oh, cool. Or something like that. Yeah, it was cool to tell. So oh, wow. I forgot about that, but now, yeah, oh wow, and that was even before Fire and Ink then. Yeah, Jeez. well before Fire and Ink. That was many, many years ago, which is why I thought you were a Detroit native. So I'm sort of surprised if you've only been there 10 years, but you've seen, I mean, we're going to talk about Detroit just for a brief hot second. You've seen major changes there in that 10 year period. Absolutely. When I um, when I first got here, being from Chicago, where Chicago is like that movie Dark City, where everything just kept changing. And so... Uh, when I got here, I saw things, you know, I'm, I, I study cities and I study uh, like migration patterns of not just people, but uh, and where they move stateside, but how people move within a city. And when I would be in the center of Detroit, which is their downtown, I just kept looking at the downtown and looking at right outside of downtown. And I would tell my friends who live here, watch something is about to happen. And they would just get on me and say stuff like, oh, that's that Chicago stuff. We don't do that here. And I'm like, OK. And sure enough, um, probably like a year after that, when they announced the light, rod, the light rail being built and all these major revitalization projects, you know, so the downtown that I knew when I first got here, which was kind of like, you know, 6, 7 p.m. is kind of dead unless you're going to the casino or a couple mm -hmm. of bars. Now it's, uh, it's, it, it pops. It pops okay. all day, all night. And, um, and even within the communities, I started looking at the communities outside of the center. And I just would, I would, when I first moved here, I would get myself lost and go into just anywhere to I find a liquor store to get a newspaper and right. other stuff. <laughs> that's how you find. That's how you find the city. The heart of yeah, the city. Yeah, that's how you find the city. And you know, I, I I found you know my crew of you know elder young you know elder women who would make me go get them the newspaper and a fifth or something, and we would sit and talk. And I just I would notice how the neighborhoods were the neighborhoods that were closest to expressways or closest to the center of a city and. You know, and I would tell people that here, and they'd be like, "Oh no, that's not happening," and it is happening. Yeah. So yeah, like the art, the culture, and the social aspects of the city definitely has it has changed in a very right. short time. 
Yeah, it's totally changed. I have a, be- a really, 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 really good friend out in Detroit. So I've been out there quite a bit. And it's uh, even the, the few visits, I can see the change. And I don't live there. But, you know, just to see it from every other year that I come by, I'm like, whoa. And, you know, the first time I went there, there were like no white people on the street that we were on. Like, I didn't see white people for like the whole visit. And when I saw one, I was like, hey, there's a white guy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then I come back a year and a half later. I'm like, oh, crap. There's white people everywhere. What happened? What happened, Detroit? And I'm not saying that's a bad or good thing. I'm just, you know, it's the truth. Yeah. On Detroit. And we're going to move on from Detroit. But before we do, how is the corona affecting you in Detroit? Uh, well, you know, you, you kind of take for granted, like, once again, you know, all my references are pretty much home team based. So being from home, it's that um, as a child, when you get up and go anywhere, everywhere at any point in time, like there's mm-hmm. somewhere, always somewhere you can go to get a sandwich, get coffee. Um, you know, even if it's late, you know, you have friends or night owls, you can say, hey, let's all meet up and let's go to Starbucks of all mm-hmm. places or let's go to uh, a diner, let's go to one of these spots and just meet up. So for me, it is uh, working in human services. We're off work right now. Oh, and we don't, okay. have, we don't have a return date because we're considered non-essential. Um, oh. My bills are essential, but that's right. a whole other conversation. Um, so, but I'm just finding that it is, um, I'm used to kind of maneuvering in this way where I'm always seeing people and even if I don't want to engage with people I'm, I'm used to being able to get up and go where people are to get things done and, mm-hmm. and it, it is kind of weighing a li- on me a little bit you know because I can only walk around you know my house so many times or walk out on the porch right. <laughs> you know? so I've been um, my my trips outside of the house have really just been to like the market mm-hmm. I had started get flowers from the market just to kind of give me a little brightness in the day and you know walking taking a quick little walk and um yeah so it's I'm used to movement and I'm used to people even if I'm not engaging with people and so for me is my site is kind of like you know a dry plant right now like Um, uh, (laughs) and it sucks you know (laughs) right it does it really does I've uh, gotten into the routine of doing nothing and I'm actually trying to break out of the routine of doing nothing, which is why I'm doing the shows. So I'm like, you know, you got to bring some kind of brightness into the house, into the life. And with your flowers, I'm doing it with the broadcast. And because we are featuring you today, and we're going to get into some words. And I say that because everything you do appears to be attached to words. Um, let's start with a little bit about what you do in the community. We, you do the Black Nine Literary Arts Salon. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And why the name Black Nine? It was a play on the Little Rock Nine. Um, I have mm. Arkansas. And so um, I was always, I've always been in, uh, basically, I've always been very, like, obsessed with small numbers of us that wind up in majority spaces of others and the things that we have to go through to just whole space. So the Little Rock Nine that came, the Black Nine came from Little Rock Nine, of which, uh, like I said, my family they're um, they're Pine Bluff, Little Rock uh, natives on my mom's side. And so some years ago, um, back home in Chicago, a group of friends and I we would get together and we would just write and we tell our stories. And then for fun, we would pick uh, our favorite books and kind of read passages from them. And so when I moved here, it was really, um, once again, you move up into a new space and it's, it's hard. D- Detroit is a very uh, compartmentalized city, in my opinion. Mm. And, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's a great thing because it allows you to uh, take some extra steps to find spaces where you can do art and you can mm-hmm. be an artist of whatever kind. But, but also not being from Detroit, Detroit, Detroitists are very guarded about mm. um, about their, who they are and what the spaces they occupy. And so I found a group of friends here um, and we just all started writing again, just, you know, kind of low key, you know. And then I decided that I said, I think we need to formalize this a little bit more. So now, right now we are in the process of uh, this group that we're doing uh, writing and we're putting together in our first anthology. So we've been doing this oh, now, wow. been now for like almost two years, maybe a couple of times, um, a year and um now you know it's, it used to just be two of us <laughs> and now there are uh seven of us uh which uh Beautiful. four of us 
four of us kind of get together a lot more often and we're in the process of just trying to make sure that we can uh, be a part of telling the narratives that do matter, not just to us, but the people around us whom we know these things mm-hmm. matter. And so with words, I just have always, um, you know, I was a kid. I started reading and writing at four years old. My mom did not believe my sisters. And she did the whole test of grabbing a book like, hey, read this. And I'm just like reading it and we'll write this. And I'm writing this. And so I've always like had this really great fascination with words and what they look like on paper. And so, Mm. you know, umpteen plus years later, um, I still have that same fascination, like a good book and some good words. Or even if I can hear a song or I can hear a conversation, which a funny conversation I heard walking down, somebody walking down the street yesterday, this woman told her whole life, I guess her husband and her sister were sleeping together. And she's on the phone. But that struck so that that struck this whole like sad thing to me. But this funny thing too that I just started playing with the words that she was saying. But <laughs> but yeah, I'll, you know. So so me and words, we have a we have a great relationship. And for a child, you know, who knew how to read and talk and write early, of course, I got told to shut up a lot. Of course, so <laughs> of course, of course. So I was always trying to find ways to, you know, well, if I had to be quiet, I was going to have to do something with the words that was circling around in here. And that's when I started uh, writing them out. So. Awesome. So anthology mm-hmm. is coming. And what is it? Yeah. I mean, are you looking for people? Is it only going to be from the, the Black Nine in the group? I mean, they're the members of the group or and what's the, what is it going to be about? What's the anthology about? So a lot of it is going to be just about... Um, just pe- so it's it's going to be open. Uh, the, the 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 seven of us are uh, hopefully we'll get those two to make it nine. <laughs> but uh, the group of us, what we're trying to just focus on um, is like a big part. Like it was going to be something that was going to be like really really technical and broad. But we started thinking as we got we started approaching this pandemic, we started mm-hmm. thinking about the part that that I think scares us and makes us very hopeful at the same time is the the theme of love and Mm -hmm. how we are trying to hold on to love or how we're trying to scramble it out and make new loves of ourselves others you know the the spaces we occupy and what that's going to look like you know after all this is over so um we still work trying to work on a working title, but it is centered around uh, different themes of love and how love in, impacts all of our lives. No. And so definitely, and definitely we will be uh, put, putting the word out to get others. Uh, absolutely. And we're trying to do that before this. Well, it was probably going to be sooner, but you know, now a lot of people's priorities are a little different. Right. So hopefully um, our goal is to probably have it done by July or June. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Well, that's quick. For an anthology, <laughs> um, and I thought you were gonna like next year. You're like, oh no, June, July this year, we'll have it done. It's ready. We got it going. But no, look, no. It, 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 it could very well be done, or it very well could not be done. <laughs> okay, gotcha, 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 gotcha. Well, when it's ready, we wanted, Mar- we wanted to do it in March, but you know that that was a bust. You know that was a yeah. bust. So. Yeah, everybody's um, we're we're um, just striving right now, striving to survive. I guess would be the best way to say that. But we always need words. So you know, while we're sitting here, I've been reading a book a day or trying to read a book a day. Um, you know, it gets a little hard, but you know, I'm I'm making myself read because that's what I enjoy. So I'm trying to make myself do that. Um, now, speaking of reading and and forcing myself a little bit, you also curate quarterly gatherings for book talks and exchanges. Now, I would love to do that online, too, with some people. Not a book club, per se, because, yeah. you know, I don't want to, I mean, I want to read that book, but if you just want to get together and talk about books, how at the girl, you know, online. Yeah. But tell it's us about girl. that. Definitely. And that was the goal, too, is that, um, you know, all of us had had, had experiences with, uh, you know, some semblance of a book club, mm-hmm. and what we all noticed about that is that Sometimes there were some books that we just were not interested in right. or, and we just didn't want to and ended up we would end up getting together talking about so many other things than the books that it would just be like, um, no, okay. <laughs> no, let's 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 talk about this. So w- what what I tried to do was kind of be like this catalyst of uh, whatever books everybody had. Um, let's you know, let's talk about them. But, you know, if we want to exchange them, let's do it. Or, right. you know, if something cool about the book and so. 
I, within the salon, we we do this piece called Passages, so which is where we read these different pieces. And so oh. that's what I kind of want to be more more like a place where, you know, the books and the books and what they look like, what they feel like, uh, mm-hmm. what they kind of conjure and what we're, we're, we're tasting on our, on our, in our senses. Um, we wanted to just make sure that we could do those things while doing a whole bunch of other fellowship uh, activities as well. Because sometimes we'll get together and we'll find that some, there's been time, there's been a time where we've all been on the same book, like unknowingly. And so we're like, well, we kind of know this book. Um, who's pouring? You know? Wow. <laughs> so, Beautiful. Uh, yeah, I so like I, that. Yeah, that's what we're doing, and I'm I, and I never even thought about doing that virtually, but I think that that would be awesome. And and see, I'm a man of lists, so I'm gonna. Write <laughs> yeah, I love the idea of that. I mean, that's what Zoom is built for 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 me. I mean, in that regard, you can talk about a, your favorite book, read a passage from it, sip a little bit of whatever moves you that day. I'm yeah. sipping tea today, so um, yeah, that'd be beautiful. Call a girl, call me if you do that online. I'm down for that. Oh, that's already, yeah. already been. Yeah, because I, you know, like I said, I like, I like to read what I like to read on my, in my off time. I don't want to be forced to read a book that I just have no interest in just so I can hang out with people that I like, you know what I'm saying? That's really why I'm doing it. I like those people. So I'm going to force myself to half-ass read this book and then get there and half-ass discuss it and then go, oh, but I really just want to catch up on your life. How are you in person, you know, and get a hug. That's really what I came for, you know, and to share maybe, you know, a little bit of that. So Again, I'm I'm looking forward to that. I think that's going to be awesome. Now we've talked, we've went around the circle a little bit, and let's talk about words written by you. Now, what I first before we get into the books and and short stories and poems that you've written, what I'd like to know is if you could describe you as a writer, like what what would someone expect if they were to pick up a, a pick up one of your books or poetry or short stories? Um, that's that. And now that is a good question. I always kind of struggle with answering that too. But what I can uh, say, I guess, I guess I can say it because it is me. Um, I, I try to put a lot of history in my uh, works. So uh, historical references are always my, uh, my points uh, that I start from. So I like to I like to play with history. I like to play with uh, different time periods, different events and incidents. And um, I like what love brings to these particular stories. And I like what mm. happens when there's a lack of love, what gets taken away. Oh. So I'm, a, um, I'm an intentional um, infusionist, historian, fiction, poet, mm. <laughs> if that makes sense. No, I can and, see uh, it. And so what I and um and I like playing with uh sounds and cadences. So I'm definitely a person who likes just what the 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 melody of regular conversations sounds like, you know. Mm. There there are certain people like I grew up hearing certain voices, uh certain people speaking and and to this day I swear these are people that could read me the instruction manual to a vacuum cleaner mm. and I would just and I probably Thank would you. get like a volume of encyclopedias of what I thought about what they were saying and what I felt about what came from that. So, yeah, oh. so that would kind of best describe me. <laughs> so you a musical writer, reader, listener. I mean, when I say musical, I mean like it, it's waves. It comes in sounds. I see in color and I think you see in music. I it? definitely see in music. I still, which is... I, me and records, me and vinyl, we have, I, I have loved records since, since the earliest that my mom showed me how to put the record on the turntable mm. and not bump the needle, you know? Gotcha. <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, a lot, oftentimes, a lot of what I do, particularly when I am uh, in a writing space, does come from music. Like, now that I'm off work, I have more time to play my vinyl. Like yesterday, I had a whole day where I made my own playlist for the day, which is I set all the records out on the floor mm. of, um, of everything I wanted to play. And it was everything from um, Ketty, Ketty Lester, who uh, whose album I bought like maybe 15 years ago. She was out in 1962. I had never heard of this woman, but 
she started performing around the same time as Phyllis Diller, and she's a black woman. She's a sister. So I was like, well, let me listen to her today. And I was not disappointed. And so I played Sylvester yesterday. I played mm. Sergio Mendes. I played um, Didi Bridgewater. I played George Benson. I played all of these things. And and Phoebe Snow alone, like, she will take you to a space where you're just like, you have to go get a pen and start writing something. Mm. Like, you have to be, like, you have to have no hands <laughs> if, if you're not thinking of something to write from just listening to, you know, Phoebe Snow. So gotcha. yeah, music, definitely, it is a great part of how I do what I do. Absolutely. Awesome. So you, you spoke of music and all the music that, that you feel uh, when it comes to words, but what is your process when it comes to writing a poem or a short story? I, um, I, <laughs> I'm, it's really bad. I am one of those people that has post-its everywhere. Like, and luckily, in my office is clean, so all the post-its are gone. But I have post-its everywhere. They're in. They're even in the notepads that I write with. So, what usually starts is I may have a thought. Um, there's a poem I wrote about these two gentlemen called Killian and Ed, and I wrote this back in 2002. And um, I heard I just was somewhere and somebody said the name Killian and I'm like Killian. Ooh, that name sounds like um, God. They must live in a small town somewhere. <laughs> and, and you know, there definitely is only one stoplight. And so mm -hmm. I remember writing that down. Killian is from a town with one stoplight. Mm -hmm. And then as I put it together, like my first chapbook. Um, which was called Conjuring, uh, Donnie Hathaway and Cairo, which I used the music of Donnie Hathaway as the backdrop for um, the civil rights movement in Cairo, Illinois. You know, mm -hmm. and you know, we would, you know, has its roots in the '60s, but it also has its roots in like um, night, Red Summer, 1919, where you know the citizens of Cairo, the black citizens, were expelled and had to run somewhere that they weren't even allowed to go, and so it'll start from a piece. And I remember writing Killian and Ed on paper. And then there was so much happening in the world um, at that time, particularly in my city of which uh, there was a young, um, was a young African-American male. He had to be like 15 and he was using the party line, the, the party line phone systems to, um, to find other LGBTQ identified people. Mm -hmm. And he was murdered mm. and, and his name was Ed. And then it just something, you know, then what came to me was the whole thing about Killian. And I was like, what if Killian and Ed knew each other? And they were from this small place. And so I would write that down. So I always have these things, these, these points that I will put down on several sheets or sometimes one sheet. And then I'll begin to play with the dialogue. So I'll have dialogue, even if it's between a person and themselves. Mm -hmm. series of, and then the pieces pretty much come from there. And um yeah, so pretty much it comes from like little notes to myself. And then I think of, uh, then something always comes to me about the timing and place. And then I'll say, well, what if these particular persons, so in the end, Killian and Ed began, became this story about these two individuals who were from Cairo, Illinois, of all places. Of course. And, and they had grown up together and they had learned how to shoot guns. And they were two little black boys who became black men. And they fell in love and the town didn't like it. And the last part of this of the of the whole poem has to do with them in a big cast iron tub. And one gets out of the tub and goes and gets two shotguns. And he and he sits them next to the um on the, the porch rail and he tells him, the first MF that comes on this porch, we shoot. And Ed says, exactly. And then it ends. So it comes from these things that uh, wow. just little notes. And then I kind of play with the period because sometimes the period may not fit. You know, right. sometimes the moment I'm trying, I, sometimes I get in trouble because I'm always trying to force something. Mm. <laughs> and then that's when I have to like, just kind of start something new. So I'm one of those people that even with notes, I am all for just saying, you know what, this is probably not going to work today or tomorrow. Right. Try something else. And, and then when it doesn't when when it doesn't even come as simple as that, and that's not really simple. But when it doesn't come as simple as that, I just play with words. Um, mm -hmm. One of my good friends, his name is Damon Percy. He and I do this thing where we take um, we'll take words and like if you can't sleep, everything that comes to your mind, you break it down to one word and on a list. And then the next day you get up and use that list to start a project. Hmm. 
Okay. For those writers in the audience and you're looking for prompts, he just gave you a great one. I know that people are always asking me that. What can I do to write? How do I start to write? There, there's a good prompt right there. If you can't sleep, write down some words. One word for each thought. Is that what you're saying? So basically summarize it as, as much as possible? Yeah, summarize it as much as possible. And even if you get it down to the thought may be a, a whole sentence, then you start looking at that sentence and saying, okay, but what's the one thing I'm getting? There's two things. And you take it, well, what's the one thing I'm getting for these two things? And you just keep on breaking it down. And then like the next day or a couple of days later, you have this reference point that you can infuse in whatever you're working on or start something new. I like the way you say infuse. You use that word quite a bit. And, and it, it fits you. It fits you in what you're doing because you are infusing not only the community, you know, with your different projects and then the anthology, of course. I mean, you're just you're doing it. And you got the music flowing through there. I see it. I see it. I see it. Now, um, <clears throat> we're, we're actually, we've been talking a good little bit, and, it, and I don't know, it doesn't feel that way, but hey, it happens. So before we get out of here, though, I do want to talk about your latest. And, and actually, I'm mentioning a little bit of your earlier work as well, because you do have very interesting titles. Uh, uh, I'm just going to go back to Magpie Fortune Cookies. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. I mean, just the titles alone. It should be enough yeah. to whet <laughs> everyone's interest. And uh, Tales of Emeralds and Acid. I mean, I was yeah. over here. I could be over there, but I'm with you. <laughs> and then your your latest, which I, I love, He Knows Nothing story. Oh, yeah. And yeah. So tell us about that, since that's your latest work. So the, with the latest work, um, as I was, uh, I had a, a bunch of uh, just stuff happening. Like, I'm from a one of those small families that just grew exponentially large, like within a couple of years. Like, so like I've been an uncle since I was eight years old and oh. now I am to the point, I'm a, am I a grand uncle now? I am a grand uncle and I'd be mm -hmm. a great grand uncle if one or one or five of these kids do, do the Molly. And so, um, I, um, I've always said like little things. So I, I realized that I've always, although I've always been this go-to person in my family, like I'm my dad's youngest child and I'm my mom's only son of four. If that, so, so I occupy these spaces where the assumption is Hank knows, well, everybody calls me Hank. So Hank knows everything. Hank knows everything. Call Hank. He can help you fill this form out, uh, which sometimes I can. Or call Hank because he can help you get into school, which I did for years as a college counselor. And so it's been um, it's been this whole ride where as I started, as I approach, uh, you know, as I approach almost being 50, I realized that I didn't like being, I don't like being the go-to person. And I, and I wish I could tell people, well, I don't know and send mm -hmm. them off somewhere else, but at the same token, not have them feel like I'm a failure. Oh, <laughs> like, gotcha. um, he's back, you know, and so uh, I just would be, I, you know, my, a lot of things that, that I made into titles were things that I made into these like real crazy sayings and people would be like, why do you say that? And I'm like, oh, well, you know, it's just something I made up, you know, so with He Knows Nothing, I wanted to come to this, uh, this, this, this resolution that it's okay to not know as much as people expect me to, but how can I take what I do know and be happy with it and still navigate, you mm -hmm. know, this life of mine of wanting to be an artist, wanting to be a good father, wanting to be a good partner, like all of these things. And the fun that I've been having with it, even when I'm crying and even when, you know, I'm a step away from asking the therapist, can they put me on meds? <laughs> can I do inpatient somewhere? You know, so that's where he knows uh, nothing came from. And the majority of the bulk of those poems have to do with my family. Um, my maternal grandfather, particularly, uh, he was a man that, his father died when he was very, very young. And because there was always like this history of me learning about my mother's family, it was always, oh, that's your uncle such. He died young. Oh, that's your uncle such. He died young. And I'm just like, well, so because up until I was probably 24, I thought I was going to die very young. Right. <laughs> Everything was very urgent. So it's around finding these connections with this man, who, uh, my, which was my grandfather, Mm -hmm. who was raised by his stepfather. 
And so it was about my journey of finding my grandfather's biological father mm -hmm. and all of the pieces about his life from birth to age nine, what that could have been like. And what this man whose name was, um, his name was Henry Fields, um, what this man had to have gone through to get my grandfather to the point where he was even by not being there physically. So it's uh, just about, once again, I love migration. So the poems are, you know, Alabama poems. They are poems all of, you know, different counties in Alabama. And then to get to uh, Chicago, where my grandfather set up his own life and met my grandmother. And so that's where he knows nothing came from. And I just wanted to find this, this space because now I'm very comfortable with uh, not knowing. And mm. I'm very comfortable with knowing that the unknown can be something that takes me away from everything I have known and changes me. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm open. I'm open to that. <laughs> I, I so, know. That's beautiful. I feel like I'm having this um, symbiotic moment here, really, truly, because I'm, I'm at the exact same spot where I don't care that I don't know anything. Uh, that I, and I don't really want to know. I don't want to learn some things anymore. I'm good. You know, yeah. what I do know, I don't care if I retain it as much anymore. You know, I'm just like, I'm telling my, I tell my wife all the time, I'm like, yeah, she's like this new program. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I don't, you know, in the day I'd have been jumping on stuff, tech. And I'm like, you know what? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'll learn what I need to, to survive. But, you know, I don't want to be the first wave anymore. And I'm good. And I, I'm comfortable. So I totally get it. And then the fact that you mentioned migration, and you mentioned Alabama, and then Chicago, and now you're in Detroit, which is an even, you know, Detroit is a migration for mostly from Mississippi, a lot of it, and and Bama. So uh, it's Alabama, interesting. The Carolinas, yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's so you're on this journey, and you're you're doing well in Detroit in the Corona times. And uh, you're making it, you know, just getting a little color in the life with flowers and things like that. And now you, you're communicating with the outside world, right? You know, I know you oh, said you absolutely, okay. absolutely. I, I met my friends, uh, I, my friends and my family. We the only thing that's kind of sad for me right now is I have a sister who is in Ghana right now, and oh. uh, and we talk every day. So it's kind of like really weird not talking to, you know. I, I've been in the house. I grew up with with her, so you know I've known her for a long time and be and talking to her every day uh and now we're in a space where sometimes we can catch each other on an app but she's four hours away so you know by eight in the evening when i'm trying to be like hey this is what's happening it's midnight there and she's like um yeah mm -hmm. i didn't get that so right. these this is so like i miss my sister she's the only one i don't get a chance to hear from very often but you know even on social media i kind of write a lot about uh like my dad my dad i talk to him every day so i can't really miss him um my mom she plays catch as catch can she's one of those people that's like why didn't you call me and it's like i called you 17 times right and right right like well i didn't know what my phone right, was right 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 you know, i'm definitely and I have a good group, a group, a group, a group of us. We're all communicating, you know, checking in. So, yeah, I definitely am communicating. Yeah. Cool. Well, we, it has been fantastic talking with you today. Henry Walker, for those who missed the beginning of the show, author, influencer, infuser. No, that's the word I want to use. Infuser. I love that. I'll take infuser. That. Uh, author, poet, short story. He has his latest out. He knows nothing. Stories. Where can they find that? Um, I'm gonna have the the links should all be because as a as I'm going to press as a self publisher, all the links to be able to buy um, all the books from He Knows Nothing, Magpie Fortune Cookies, and Tales of Emeralds and Acid. They'll be able to it can be found on my WordPress blog, which is being forty something WordPress dot org. I think that's what it is. Yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> all right. Repeat that WordPress blog once more for our listening audience, please, sir. It is. Um, I just said it. Uh, how did I forget it that fast? So it is being 40. So it's being the number 40 something, uh, being 40 something WordPress dot blog dot com. Got it. All right. So again, this is Henry Walker and this is Kat Williams with Zipping on Ink. And we will be back tomorrow at 10 a.m. if we can get it on time. Because it's been a tech 
challenge for me in these last few days with this Facebook Live stuff, but I wanted to bring it directly to you, the show, and it's been fun so far. So far, it's been really, really fun, and I've had a great time with you today, Henry. This has been freaking fantastic, so I want to thank you so much. No I knew it was going to be good, though. I knew it was going to be good, because, you know, I follow you <laughs> on Facebook. Henry does like words, so I knew this was going to be a really good interview, but we'll be back tomorrow at 10 a.m., and uh, we'll see you then. And again, this is Cat Williams. Peace and love, y'all. Thanks, Cat. <laughs>